This program contains graphic material which may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation, committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. <laughs> Bonnie Urbe. Welcome to To the Contrary's yearly film festival called All About Women and Girls. As a platform for first-time filmmakers, we highlight the best work in four categories. They are current events about advancing the rights of girls, women, or diverse communities in the U.S., changing cultural attitudes on gender from a woman's perspective, U.S. women's history, and the student entry category. This week's winning entry won the U.S. Women's Issues Award. It's about a disturbing practice called female genital mutilation. It contains graphic material, which may not be suitable for all audiences, so viewer discretion is advised. Filmmaker Dr. John Chua spent more than a decade investigating this issue all over the globe, and in this documentary, The Cut, he looks at FGM in the United States. took me to a doctor who said, well, I can fix that, and cut off my clitoris. In the self of a man where I'm from, it's all type 2. They cut our clitoris down and they sold us so that we just have a small hole. And type 4 is all other categories which can be pulling or tugging or it could also be cutting and lacerations as I've seen done in northern Nigeria. What if the media's coverage of FGM as an African or Muslim problem has obscured its true extent and nature. For a good part of a decade, I traveled the world researching FGM practices, interviewing cutters, survivors, supporters, and opponents of FGM. My name is John Chua. I'm a university professor teaching cultural studies and with research interests in human behavior across nationalities, religions, and continents. Small and big communities around the world have their own native cutting traditions. In my research, I found that the practice is often secretly performed, but without a doubt, humans on every continent except Antarctica have cut to control fears of female sexuality. But what about in the United States? Could the obsession to control sexuality, female sexuality, also have a tradition there? As my research reached its final stage, I realized that it did, involving at its heart a name well known to all of us from our breakfast table. FGM has a long and forgotten history in the US. From the 1860s to the 1960s, 
Some Christian doctors and parents recommended female genital cutting to prevent girls from masturbating. It is a piece of history that many Americans would now prefer to forget. A leading proponent of removing the clitoris to prevent masturbation was Dr. John Kellogg, the inventor of cornflakes. In his book, he advocated burning the clitoris with acid or removing it entirely as a cure for masturbation. When I was three years old, my mother was concerned about the fact that I was masturbating, since she had read someplace that it was the ultimate sin. Took me to a um, doctor in a clinic in North Dakota, who took me to a hospital in Minnesota and removed my clitoris. That was 22 years ago. And I didn't even know that it was videotaped. Back in 1994, Renee wanted to remain anonymous. She was not a scheduled speaker, and her talk was spontaneous and unplanned. The only clue to find her was the name of the meeting itself. I contacted anyone I could find who was there, and amazingly, someone remembered her name. After several months of searching, I managed to meet her and convince her to go public with her full story. And I didn't even know it existed. Then... Dr. Chua also found this video. And so it's just really quite amazing to me that it has been out there for over 20 years and I didn't, and there has been no response to it until now. In my research, I started really in the 1860s um, looking at when female circumcision and clitoridectomy were used to treat masturbation. Um, and I started then because that's really when medical journal publications really start to proliferate in the United States. And so you start actually seeing published cases of the use of female circumcision or clitoridectomy to treat masturbation during the sort of mid 19th century period. I was three years old when it happened to me. Um, my mother was concerned that I was masturbating and my little face turned very red. So she took me to a doctor. Um, who said, well, I can fix that, and cut off my clitoris. I remember the pain. I remember seeing my mother at the end of the table. She said that she held me and walked the hospital floors until I quit crying. As I was growing older, she told me she knew it was a mistake and that I was not supposed to ever talk about it. Kellogg's Corn Flakes was created somehow and advertised as being able to stop masturbation. And my mother, if she caught me as I was growing older, would say, stop that, it will make you insane. A lot of Americans don't know about this particular type of history, this, this practice within the United States historically, um, is because it was a quick procedure and it was done in a physician's office and also because probably it wasn't something that families probably really talked about um, amongst themselves either, uh, largely because of the reasons it was done. John Kellogg was not the only physician advocating this practice. Well into the mid 20th century, the mindset continued to linger. Dr. Harold Shirock was a prominent member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Dean of Loma Linda University Medical School a well-known education and research institution associated with the Adventist Church. Today, the church plays a major role against FGM, as evident in their campaigns and medical treatments for survivors. But back in 1951, Shryock published a book on becoming a woman, still available as an e-book on Amazon and on the Seventh-day Adventist website. The text recommends female circumcision as a prevention for masturbation. I had this uncomfortable tugging in my genital area and when I got my driver's license at age 15, I went up to the clinic and said, some stupid doctor did this to me and now I, I'm really uncomfortable. And this was a Seventh-day Adventist clinic and the doctor gave me a book on the sin of self-pleasuring. Ultimately, 
The Adventists were not the only Christians of that era who believed in female genital cutting, but there now seems to be a collective amnesia that prominent American doctors, such as Kellogg and Shryock, have advocated for FGM at one time. Because he actually advocated the circumcision or cutting of those genitals. I do not know that. No? Uh, it's never... in his books. Um, yeah. Is that true? It's, it's in his books. Well, now there's a sort of subject to go back and look at. When masturbation becomes a habit, she adopts an attitude of stupidity. The remedy consists of a minor surgical operation, spoken of as circumcision. I, I'm uh, surprised by that, but uh, I can tell you for sure the official position of the church today would be totally against that. I don't know that anybody reads Harold Schrock today. That isn't, doesn't have anything to do with who we are today. So, female circumcision and clitoridectomy were used in the 19th century through the mid-20th century to treat masturbation. And in the 19th century, masturbation was believed to necessitate treatment because it was seen as being dehabilitating to the body. The number of women in America who were cut and are still alive today is unknown. So in the 1960s was the last published case of a physician referring to the use of clitoridectomy to treat masturbation. I was about three years old probably at the time. I have a very vivid memory of the experience. I was in a bed with a crib bars on it. I remember standing and being very frightened, not knowing what's going on, but feeling that something terrible was about to happen. And I remember being laid down in a room. I have, I can remember people talking to me, coaxing me through the procedure. And then I remember this excruciating pain as my clitoris was pulled from my body and removed. I get, I get asked often how common female circumcision or clitoridectomy was practiced in the United States. And I would say, and I, what I always say to people is it's not, it was never rare, but it also wasn't common. The fact that it was performed um, in states all across the United States from, and I know that from where the physicians were publishing about it. What I always tell people again is it wasn't rare, but it wasn't common. It's kind of in between there. Where did sort of American physicians learn about female circumcision clitoridectomy? Um, from what I can tell, they would have gotten information most likely from British medical journals uh, because British medical journals were publishing about the procedure in the earlier 19th century, and American physicians would have read about the procedures from there. That's at least the one source that I can identify through sort of text of saying this, there's a, there's a, there's a, this is how physicians would have probably learned about it would be from the British publications about it. Or one of the most notorious practitioners of female circumcision, or rather clitoridectomy, he just performed clitoridectomy, was Isaac Baker Brown, who was a British physician who in the 1860s, the British medical press published a lot about because he was charged with performing the operation too commonly. Dr. Isaac Baker Brown was a prominent 19th century gynecologist who was also the president of the Medical Society of London. He operated and practiced in Connaught Square in central London. There, he advocated cutting off the clitoris to cure insanity, epilepsy, and a number of other illnesses. There was an idea physicians had, particularly in the 19th through the early 20th century, that the sort of clitoral size indicated, um, could, could indicate to them masturbation or what they would have deemed as homosexual behavior or that that, that then and also a larger clitoris was sort of deemed with hypersexuality. Certain bodies, particular bodies, um, of women of color were seen as being inherently hypersexual. This idea goes back though to this, that they could read the body by looking at it and that the clitoris would sort of tell them. One of the ways that it was sort of believed to be seen on the body was there was an expectation that the body would manifest itself hypersexuality through the sort of elongated or larger clitoris. My journey took me from the deserts of the Middle East to the streets of America, but still I wondered is FGM still occurring in the U.S. today? 44-year-old Dr. Jumana Nargawala is charged with genital mutilation, conspiracy, and lying to federal agents, facing up to life in prison at this point. One girl said it was done to, quote, get the germs out. The other girl said she screamed, got a shot, and it was so bad she felt pain down to her ankle, according to court documents. 
There are cases where families think that it's safer to take their child to a clinic to get caught. There's a large Somali community in Minnesota. A lot of times when parents are taking their kids during the off months from school, um, either back home to Somalia or to different Middle Eastern countries um, like Dubai or Egypt, and they're taking their kids to get caught. Um, and just this last week, there was an Egyptian young lady who passed away due to female general cutting. In the United States, as in many Western countries, it is illegal to take a daughter overseas for genital cutting. Recently, there were rumors about families from the West bringing girls to Singaporean medical clinics for circumcision. But when we called the clinics, they all said that they would not cut a foreign child. But I had to find out for myself. We want to get a consultation um, Ask some questions first. on our daughter. Because we, we brought her from Britain and people in Britain uh, warn us against it. What we normally do here is just make a nick at the clitoris skin. Doctor, is there blood then? Yes, a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little bit. Is there anesthesia? No, no. They use the scissors. The scissors. The child will just, it will just heal and recover after, after, after a few days. So it's like giving her a, a vaccine and injection is the same, the, the pain is the same. How much do you charge? I think, I can't remember, but I think it's $20. Oh, that's it, oh, okay. Uh, you just um, discuss, if you want to read, you can read, if you don't read, it's fine. Because they're older, they kick more. They tell if it's older, please bring someone strong to hold down her legs, oh. because doctor's not strong. I brought her back from America. We were living in America. She was born in America. It's not too late. You know, good so far. And, and you still have time. Okay. But some activists point out not all FGM is illegal or being carried out in secret locations. Shocking as it may seem, some critics allege that FGM exists in the beauty industry. Because by the World Health Organization's definition, it does. But is that really FGM? I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. I'm also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. My concern is that in the practice of what I perform, the World Health Organization, which includes the United States, is stating that what I perform is female genital mutilation, and it's not. Essentially, let's, let's talk about clitoral hood reduction. I am removing a portion of the redundant skin from the clitoral hood, which is the fleshy skin part that covers the clitoris, and reducing that. Now, by definition, that would be a 1A. In the other parts, any of those, including type 2A, where I'm cutting, trimming, reducing the labia minora, would fall into a 2A. And type 4, I'm saying is that's anybody who goes to a tattoo parlor right now and gets a clitoral hood piercing, tattoos, ornamentation, dermabrasion, laser hair removal, which is a form of cauterization, Social attitudes regarding um, FGM is really interesting because on one hand, you can have a female who gets vaginal piercings or tattoos or what have you, and that is viewed as really cool. Or on the other hand, you can have a female um, who's been um, circumcised and there's a stigma that follows it. Um, it's really hard to understand why one is attached to a stigma and the other one is viewed as cool. That people are having this procedure because they want to look prettier. They want to look tidier. And I don't think that, that goes along with cultural desires, with the grooming that goes along with that, with wearing bathing suits, with working out. And I think that as the standards get higher, people become increasingly more self-critical of what perfection is. And they're seeking that perfection. The problem is that there is no standard. The only understanding, I guess, or explanation that could be attached to this is cultural prejudice. I'm saying this because I'm against FGM. I don't want anybody to think that I'm supporting FGM in any way, or shape, or form. I'm just giving you perspective. One effect of the mutilation that continued for 50 years 
was the scar tissue um, causing a tugging sensation that did not stop until menopause and my scar tore apart. It was a painful experience. And I think about women throughout the world whose scars were much more intense and uh, extensive than mine and wonder what their experiences have been with the discomfort, the ongoing discomfort. Uh, and this makes me very sad. The most dangerous ramification of genital cutting is difficulty giving birth. My scar did not stretch, so my first child was in danger of becoming stuck in the birth canal. I had an extensive episiotomy, and a couple of months after the birth, I came back to my doctor saying, I I'm not healing. Now, this is a challenge for doctors who are not expecting this complication. Without medical intervention, I, like many mutilated women, could have died in childbirth. Yeah, I would say that about the 90%, I would say, of Somali women are have experience FGM. Um, so then they're dealing with these issues, uh, getting a C-section during labor because they're not able to progress during second stage labor due to, you know, the scar tissue. Um, and these women are, don't want to have C-sections. Uh, and these doctors don't understand exactly what their stories are. Even going through puberty and wondering what is it going to be like? How much like other women will I be? Mm -hmm. The thing about sexual response is how do we know what it would be like if we had all of those sensible, sensitive uh, nerve endings? Our backgrounds are completely different. We come from two different parts of the world, yet we share something that's um, very intimate and we've been through that experience together. So there's a level of understanding between us um, and I think it's really important for people to know that this does not affect just one community or one religion or one group of people. It's something that happens around the world. And for me, meeting Phil Son has meant um, I can discuss things that I couldn't discuss with my, my friends or my family who haven't experienced it, but we can share this at um, the emotional level, as yeah. well as the cognitive level of what it has meant. And for me too, it's really comforting to know that I could go to uh, Renee for questions because she she's lived more than me and she's married, she's had kids, and I have not reached that stage of my life yet. So I know that I you know, have someone that I could speak to if I ever had questions about anything. Vilsan being Muslim, me being Christian, we had the same experience. And it has been very refreshing for us to be able to talk about that and to be at that same level of uh, remembering the pain. It will always be with us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. This is not my shame. The shame belongs to our culture, the medical profession, um, and I no longer um, feel that I need to stay silent.
We hope you found this edition of our All About Women and Girls Film Festival enlightening. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.